Hey, it's good to see you. By the way, I've got to ask a question. How many of you, in singing that song, I Surrender All, you have come down to the altar and you've said, Lord, I surrender? How many of you have ever done that? You know, you think about that. Roger, thank you that we sang that song. You know, we were talking about that a little bit uh, yesterday at the men's prayer breakfast. And uh, this, last, this last week, <clears throat> I don't, don't you sometimes, you just, it's like, Lord, there's so much of this world, more and more, that's going wrong. But you're in charge. Lord, there's nothing worth holding on to. Nothing. What's eternal is what matters. That's what matters. And you know what's eternal? People's souls. You know, I, I, I look in the mirror, I don't see a youth pastor anymore. <laughs> but you know, there was a young man across the street I was witnessing to, and uh, I was gone, and he came over and started talking to my wife. Afterwards, I gave him a gospel tract, 17 years old. And uh, he said, boy, that, with everything that's going on today, that really spoke to me. I can't wait to get back and talk to that young man again. In fact, there's two young men that uh, I'm talking to there. It's exciting to tell people about Jesus, you know what? It really is. And then with everything going, I, uh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so looking forward to the message this morning. I, please forgive me. You know, I, I know there's probably maybe somebody that winds up saying, you know, I wish you would, you know, you talk about this every once in a while and can't you get over it? No, I can't. I, I loved it when I was in construction and working on an all-Christian concrete crew. It was, it was just, it was just great. When I came over into ministry, and now, you know, being a pastor, one of the things I hate is that, oh, you're a preacher, you know, you're supposed to talk like this. Well, no, I, we talk like this because we're believers in Christ, amen? But, you know, when I was doing, the, when, when I was doing construction, it was just, it was so much fun, and the main passage we're going to go to this morning is one that I remember I was in my boss's truck and we were talking about the Bible. I was talking about what I just read in my devotions. And it was such a kick. It was, you know, we, we just had a ball with it. And that's one of the reasons why I thought, you know, I'm going to go ahead and bring this. Now, we're going to go through a lot of scripture. But the food is going to be there. Let's not worry about that. Let's see what God has for us this morning. Because I believe if we're listening to His Spirit, He can encourage us. With all that we see, He can encourage us. You know, there was a saying that uh, I came across, I forget what it was, if I read it, if I heard it, and it went like this, it goes like this. People's perceptions, people's perceptions are their realities. Now they might not be what is true to fact, but they are their realities. Now, what I mean by that, well, what I think the, the person that said that, what, he, what they meant was this. Somebody can see something, a situation, whatever, and they come to a conclusion. Maybe they're not all that interested in it, but they've looked at it, and there it is. But then they learn more, and it's like, oh, that's different. Their perception changes. Now it's the same situation, but the reality of the situation has changed. Do you realize that's what God does with his 
word. You know the verse, Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We wind up hearing from God's word, and suddenly things have changed. How many of you remember the first time you heard the gospel and you recognize, oh, wait a minute, that thing or those things that I like to do, that's called sin, and the wages of sin is death. And all of a sudden, your perception changes, right? So there was a time when most, if not all of us, learned about our sin, God's love, His Son, what He went through, how He died, how He rose again, and now, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And all God's people said, but it goes beyond that now. Because there are perceptions of life. There are perceptions of Him. Sometimes if we're not careful, those things can get tweaked. We can wind up misunderstanding what it is the Lord is trying to show us, teach us, how He's trying to lead us. What we wind up seeing, and it's like, well, Lord, wait a minute. Where we're going to this morning is a classic example of a man who wound up seeing things differently because of God. So let's pray, and we will uh, we'll get into this. By the way, I'm going to do a quick aside real quick. Brother Mango, good to see you. Can you do me a favor? Because if I don't ask you now, I'm going to forget it. I want your son's address, who's in the Navy now, Daniel. Can you get that to me this morning? Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it big time. All right. We're back to the message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would guide us now. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these folks. Lord, we love them. It is, it's so good to be with them. This is what ministry is all about. I pray that there are perceptions that will change this morning. I pray in Christ's name and joy to do it so. Amen. All right, you ready? How many of you got your Bible? I know, and some of you say, well, I got it on my phone, I got it on my tablet, however you got it, but can I encourage you in something like this? I read a lot of my Bible on my iPad. However, I take this out, and there are notes that I have here, and I can see them. They're there. Never, never give up the real thing, the book. All right, here we go. Matthew 1. Would you please turn to it? Matthew chapter 1. Can you believe it? In less than, my soul, in three months, it's going to be 2023. And of course, we all know that 2023 is going to be a lot better in 2022, right? Kind of like we were really believing that this would be better than 2021. Oh, forget it. Never mind. All right. Now, but in less than three months, what are we going to be celebrating? Not New Year's. A little bit for Christmas. And so we wind, we wind up going to different passages. And one of those things, a lot of times, is this. Look at Matthew 1. Now go all the way down to verse 11. We're in those genealogies. And sometimes we just go through them real fast. Look at verse 11. And Josiah begat Jeconias and his brethren. About the time, this is important, that they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel. Now, Jehoiakim is a king we're going to be looking at. He's already been mentioned. 
Here he is called Jeconiah. Sometimes he's called Kaniah in the Old Testament. Same person. But the main focus is going to be the man that's named here at the end of verse 12, Zerubbabel. He's also mentioned in the other genealogy in Luke chapter 3. Now, leave Matthew. We're going to the Old Testament. Would you please go to 2 Kings chapter 24? 2 Kings chapter 24. One of my favorite places because I love reading about uh, Josiah. But we're leaving him behind. There have been a couple of kings now. It's amazing when you go through the kings for the ten northern tribes, king after king after king after king is wicked. But it's not always the case with Judah. This is after the kingdom split. But toward the end, there were problems. King after king after king was indeed wicked. Here's a young man who followed in the footsteps of those that were wicked. 2 Kings 24, would you please look at verse 8. It's the one that we mentioned before from Matthew 1. Jehoiakim, or Jehoiachin, we'll just say Jehoiakim, was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. And his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of el of Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. According to Scripture, comparing Scripture with Scripture, this is what happened. In 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Chronicles, we find this out, that this young man actually started to reign with his father when he was eight years old. Ten years later, he wound up taking the throne all by himself. But just three months and ten days after he began to reign, this happened. Look at verse 10. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. We're not going to go into it now. It's not important, but just to let you know, three times uh, Nebuchadnezzar came up against Jerusalem and carried away people, things out of the temple, etc. Look at verse 11. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers. And the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. That is the eighth year of the reign of the king of Babylon. Now go down to verse 17. And the king of Babylon made Metaniah his father's brother king in his stead and changed his name to Zedekiah. Now, maybe you've read this before in the Old Testament. If not, you need to. It's fascinating reading all these kings of Israel and then of Judah. But we're looking at specifically Jehoiakim. He was in the Davidic line. Now, let's see. Where was the Davidic line headed to? Who was it that eventually we wind up seeing? His name is Jesus. Jesus Christ. Now, go to 2 Kings 25. 2 Kings chapter 25. Look at verse 27. And it came to pass in the seven and thirtieth year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the twelfth month, on the seven and twentieth day of the month, that, I, I love this guy's name. I'm telling you, that this, somebody was really, whatever. Evil Merodach. Man, if that's a bad guy in some movie, 
you know, grade B movie. I, <laughs> King of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, did lift up the head of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, out of prison. Now this is fascinating. The scripture tells us of something that happens to Jehoiakim. Well, there's a reason. There's a reason, and we'll see it later. But just to know that even in the midst of not too good of a situation, folks, remember, Israel has been destroyed. They sinned, and they have, they have paid a horrible price. The temple is gone. The gold, the silver, everything, it's been destroyed. It's been taken captive. It's done with, as far as the world is concerned. But then we're not dealing with the world. We're dealing with the God of heaven. And here was a young man carried off at 18 who's in the line. And years go by, and he's in prison. But then one day, look at this again, verse 28. And he spake kindly to him and set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon and changed his prison garments. And he did eat bread continually before him all the days of his life. And his allowance was a continual allowance given him of the king a daily rate for every day, all the days of his life. So, this guy, who is the grandfather of a man by the name of Zerubbabel, this guy, this man, is lifted up. He's taken care of. He has a family. He has a son. And then there's a grandson. Now, would you please go to the book of Ezra, chapter 1. Ezra, chapter 1. I have it all written over here. I want to put my Bible where it's at because I do have notes here, but anyway, I'm reading bigger stuff now. Ezra chapter 1, please look at verse 1. Now, just, just real quick. Judah and Israelites that had fallen to Judah are now in Babylon. And again, they're, they're reaping what they've sown. But then... 70 years later, something happens. Now, Babylon has fallen. The Medes and the Persians overtook them. They're now in the Medo-Persian Empire. Ezra 1, verse 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah by be, might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. By the way, an aside, was he a, because of the way he talked, was he a believer? Not necessarily. Now there were those, I believe Nebuchadnezzar saw God for who he was, and it's like, oh my. But also, including rulers in the Medo-Persian Empire, they knew how to use the gods of those that they conquered to kind of make things cozier with the people, like, well, he hasn't said anything bad about my God. But with this, there might be a little bit more. Just, again, just as kind of an aside, but God is using him to recognize something that is in God's eternal purposes. All right, just wanted to say that. Let's go back to verse 2. Thus saith 
Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you, of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. Now, we're going to skip a lot, but could you go please to chapter 3? Ezra chapter 3. Look at verse 1. And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Joshua, the son of Josedek, and his brethren, the priests, and, what's his name? Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Now, wait a minute. Let's just, let's just stop here. As we're going to see later on, there's a little over 42,000 people that wind up going back. They hear the call of the king of the Medo-Persian Empire, and they go back, including a man by the name of Zerubbabel. Was Zerubbabel in the kingly line? Yes. Yes. He was in the kingly line. I got to thinking about this, and I thought, you know what? I I can imagine at times the Zerubbabel might have thought, you know, here I am. I'm 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 in this place. I'm a servant. We're captives of another country. But because of our sin. I could have been a king. I could have been king. But I'm not. Now, his grandfather was wicked. I don't know what happened. The Bible doesn't tell us. But something between grandpa and dad and then himself, something changed. Now, there were some prophets, and we're going to be going to one of them specifically. There were some prophets that helped these people see the proper perception. But right now, we just know this. This man, Zerubbabel, is back in the place that he heard of. He, he, he was born in a foreign country, but he heard of a land, and I'm sure he heard stories. He heard stories of greatness of David and Solomon and a beautiful temple and a country that was so blessed, but then came wickedness and came the price for that wickedness. I'm sure he learned so much. And the scriptures that were already written, the history of Israel. And now here he is. Folks, the land isn't what it used to be. He walks in. It's overgrown. It's broken down. The temple is gone. It's gone. What was there has been carried off. But he's there. Zerubbabel is there. Now, go to verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8. Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God in Jerusalem, in the second month, began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests, 
and the Levites and all that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forth the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren and Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen of the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad, with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. Verse 11, And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. Folks, because of what had been written in time past, these people now are remembering just how good their God is. Go back to verse 11. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Now I'm going to show some ignorance here. I don't know exactly how they were building the stone. See, this is what I wind up thinking. Okay, there they are. They got their concrete tools out. The Kaiser sand and gravel trucks have just backed up. They get, you know, the thing spinning and they go ahead and the guys start, you know, they get their screed out, you know, and stuff and they're laying the foundation. That's what we would have done. That's not what's happening. Whatever it is, however they're doing it, the foundation is being laid. But understand, it's the foundation of the temple. Look at verse 12. But many of the priests and Levites and the chief of the fathers who were ancient men, in other words, they were older than Roger, they had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. Now, get this picture. This is important. There's groups of people there. There's younger ones, they've heard the stories, the foundation is laid, and they're going, yeah, we're back. Our God is great. But then there's the ancient men, the older ones, who even as children, they remember Solomon's temple. How it was like. Oh, it's beautiful. And maybe they remember the stories of how it was covered with gold. In fact, in the time of Solomon, remember reading this in your Bible? That silver, there was so much of it, it was like rocks. I mean, it was everywhere. There was silver, there were precious jewels, there was the gold inside and out. My soul, there was the, there was the brazen altar outside, the, the laver, where they'd wash, there they were, they, they were um, images of bulls, three going this way, going this way, going there. I mean, incredible stuff. These things were beautiful, massive. And they start, and the ancient men begin to remember. You know, I, I love hearing, and they're dying, they're, they're a dying breed. But I would love hearing what ancient men remembered about revivals in America. This last Wednesday, we read about the, the revival of 1858 and how because of a call to have prayer at lunch, it went from coast to coast. 
And millions were saved. And churches were started. And then we hear about this revival and this revival and this revival. And we think, ah, you know, would love to see that again. And praise God, we would. But there's something. And I believe that this is stirring in the hearts of God's people. Because there is something that we have that is more precious than the temple that's being written, that's being written about here. But please bear with me, okay? Please bear with me and go with me on this. I want you now to turn to Acts chapter, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, back up. Ezra chapter 5. Ezra chapter 5. Then the prophets, now this is verse 1, Ezra 5, verse 1. Then the prophets, and the first prophet that is mentioned here is Haggai. I love Haggai. And Zechariah, I just read most of the, the book of Zechariah this morning for my devotions. The son of Iddo prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedach. He was the high priest, uh, Jeshua was, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. I love this. I can just see this picture. These preachers, these prophets, they just didn't come with their robes. They came with their work clothes. They came with their work boots. They're in the middle of it. They got their shovels. Isn't that great? I mean, they were there. They were ready to build. Now, what was going on during this time? Now, we focused already on Zerubbabel. But there are details that we need to learn. And now... I want you to go toward the end of the Old Testament and I want you to turn to the book of Haggai. All right? Now we've determined Zerubbabel is an interesting individual. He's there. He's there as a special person, really, because if they had not been carried away, he would have been king. It was just captivating to me. What's going through Zerubbabel's mind? Well, we're going to find out a little bit more now. Like I said, I love the book of Haggai. It's only two chapters long, but it's fascinating, the, 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 the picture that it gives you about what's taking place at this time. Remember now, there's a little over 42,000 Jews that have come back. On top of that, there's a little over 7,300 servants and maidens that came with them. On top of that, they have a choir of 200. You know, that they're, they're, they're there to sing. I don't know why they, you know, the Lord said, put that in too. But there's only 42,000. Now, can I ask you something? Weren't there a little more than 42,000 Israelites before all this? Yeah. There were millions of them. The 12 tribes? 42,000? That's nothing. Here come 42,000 people. For whatever reason, the Lord has laid it on their heart to come. Remember? So here they are. They've heard about this land. There's a few of them, they remember it. And they come, and oh my, what a mess. I wonder if Grandma and Grandpa's house is still around. No, it's not. Wow, there's a lot of work to be done. Will this ever be the same? Haggai, chapter 1, 
Look at verse 1, please. In the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, his son of, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. He wasn't king, but they made him governor, praise God, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying. Now we're about to find out what happened. This tells us a little bit. The time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Say it with me, the next three words. Consider your ways. I had just read this in my devotions. And I was in my boss's truck. And we were talking about this. And it was like, man, you got to see you know, this. Consider your ways. And we just had a ball talking about it. You know, about how God's people, we need to do this. Consider... Your ways. Now, that's not the only consideration we wind up getting. But please, again, what time is it? Oh boy, I gotta learn, I gotta move. Look at verse six. Ye have sown much. Oh, excuse me, verse. Where did I read? Okay, verse five. That's right. Okay. Look at verse six. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled, <coughs> excuse me, with drink. He clothe you, but there is none warm, and he that earneth wages earneth wages to put it into a bag. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when it was you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. In other words, I'm judging you. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon the, all the labor of the hands. Verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. See, there was this time when God said, through Haggai, wait, don't you understand? You're here for a reason. I brought you here. Yeah, but Lord, look, I mean, I need a comfortable place to live, my family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. God says, I understand that, but what about me? What about my house? Now, there was a time, there was a time when they had David, the mighty man of valor. There was a time when they had Solomon with riches beyond comprehension. Nations feared them. They sent people to them to learn of wisdom, like with Solomon. They saw the beauty of it all, etc. And there were kings that did just that. Hezekiah, on down the line. But that's no more. But something is about to take place 
Folks, we really are almost done, but I need for you to hang in there with me. I want you to go to Haggai chapter 2 now. Haggai chapter 2, look at verse 1. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shaltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison as of nothing? Hey, those of you that saw the temple before, now you look at what you're doing. I know what you're thinking. Is it now to you as of nothing? Look at verse 4. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work once again, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. That was hundreds of years ago. He says, I made a covenant, and it's still good. So my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once in a little while, and I will shake, listen, now listen to what God says here. I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations And the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. How would that happen? With the desire of all nations. Let me ask you something. Who is the desire? of all nations. Who did you trust as Savior? Folks, you got to be talking to me. Do you really know him? Then say it. Jesus. Jesus Christ. He's talking to Zerubbabel, who's in the line, and he says, this... You know, imagine this. Imagine this. When um, when I was in the Air Force, the Air Force base that I was in in Arizona was in Chandler. Chandler was the Rio Linda of Arizona. I mean, it was hick to the nth degree. Not anymore. I was just talking to somebody recently that lives there in in Gilbert next door. Gilbert was nothing. Chandler was nothing. Now, try to find and buy a house there. It's unbelievable. Incredible. We can look at something just like these Jews. They looked around and go, wait wait a minute. Lord, there's going to be glory here? Yes, because there's somebody coming. Haggai chapter 2, look at verse 8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house, yeah, you know, this one that we're building in the place of where Solomon's temple was, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Go down to verse 21. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword his brother. Verse 23, In that day saith the Lord of hosts, 
will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet. For I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Zerubbabel is the sign. The Davidic line is reestablished. They're back. The temple being built, it's not like the Solomon's temple was before, but several hundred years later will come the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh, not the, he's going to come as a servant. He's going to die and be rose, risen again. And then there's coming the time. Then after that came God, the Holy Spirit. Now, take your Bibles, go to the New Testament, turn to the book of Colossians, our last passage, and then we'll be done. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Please bear with me. We, we can't lose it here, folks. We can't lose it here. Remember, here's Israel. Boy, what a wasteland. Everything's tore up. The houses are destroyed. Jerusalem. It's, it's horrible. Lord says, build it will build. Foundation gets laid. Boy, it's hard work. But then Haggai speaks up. He says, Zerubbabel, come here. I want to talk to you. He says, I want you to know something. You might, or people that are here, you might get discouraged because this isn't like it used to be. I've got news for you there's coming a time when it's going to be absolutely off the charts. Now you listen to me. In time past, God has really moved. Yeah, but you know, hadn't seen it lately. Wait a minute. Is the Holy Spirit still here? Is the Holy Spirit still here? You might be voting me out after this. I don't know, but I'm about ready to just start walking on, on, on seats. Yes, he is still here. Does our God change? He doesn't? Does he love us less? Then what in the world are we upset about and discouraged about? Talk to me. Where is it? What happened to trusting him? To saying, Lord, I am thine and all that I have. Where did it go? You know, there's a phrase I read. It was, oh yeah, in Haggai. Consider your ways. In fact, if you, look at the, if, if you look at the outline there that I, a long time ago, consider your ways. Consider your waste. You know, you've tried to build something and I'm not letting it work. Consider your worship. You're building your houses and you ain't coming to me because there's no place to go. And then came that time when Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest, said, Lord, consider it done. We're rolling up our sleeves. We're going after it. Glory? We just read something about the glory that would come. You realize that this little Cinder block building is greater than Solomon's temple. You know why? Because of who is here. Well, he's not here. 
if your God isn't here, you need to trust Christ as Savior because my God is here. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Amen? Amen. I want to show you something in the book of Colossians chapter 1. Go to verse 21 if you would, and then we're done. Paul writes, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, wherefore, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest. It's seen, like Haggai said it would be, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whose glory? Not mine. God's glory. God's glory. You know, the one that was coming when Haggai, by God, told Zerubbabel, there's coming a glory. You got people thinking about the first temple. (laughs) I've got news for you. When Christ went into that temple, the glory was magnificent. Yeah, but he was crucified. Yeah, but he's coming again. And oh, my soul, when it happens. You see, there is no reason for us to be discouraged. Well, we get into the routines. Ain't nothing routine about ministry. We don't know what God is going to do. How many of us wind up coming with an air of expectation? I've been sitting on this thing for a month and it's been driving me nuts. But it's like, yes, Lord. And this, this, is, what's, this is what's been driving me, you know, and, and sometimes driving me to tears because it's like, you know, we, we, we wind up having eyes of flesh instead of eyes of faith. But you know what needs to change? Perception. Some people would walk in and they would see us all here and they would think, oh, it's a group of people. No, it's not a group of people. It's the body of Christ. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. Yeah, but no, no, no. He's there. The Bible says so. Not for your glory, not for my glory, but Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. And remember, in the Bible, a hope is a sure thing. The hope of glory. His glory. So you know what? Next month, we'll do the two-minute warning. And you know something? It'll be glorious, not for us, but for Him. Because God does a work. But meanwhile, we've got young people we're giving the gospel to. We've got older people we're giving the gospel to. Kids are learning things on Wednesday night. We open up God's Word on Sunday, and every day we can sing 
I surrender all. Because he is worthy, like Brad reminded us. Folks, let's not miss out. The children of Israel could have gone to their old homeland, looked around and said, oh man, I don't know what we're going to do. Hey, you know something? Why, why don't we go to the beach? No. God told them, and they went to work. And God blessed. This has been such a burden on my heart for me. I hope and pray that we can truly sing, all to Jesus I surrender.